people to serve. So reach out to Cheryl if you want to do that. And, uh, anything else? All right, let us be called to worship. Our Good Shepherd has led us to this place. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. Even though we walk through dark valleys, even though we are fearful and in need of comfort. Our cup overflows with God's goodness and mercy. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord our whole lives long. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd that loves us and calls to us. May we hear your call. May we silent, silence the other voices in our thoughts and in our hearts and listen for you. Amen. Please rise and greet one another and pass the peace. <laughs> You do it. 
how quiet we do it. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, today is Good Shepherd Sunday, and Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And so you, as you all take care of your pets and call them, Jesus takes care of us. We're not necessarily his pets, though, right? There's a, you can't compare those two. But God calls us and says, come to me. Come to me. Be with me. I love you. And so Jesus cares for us in ways we can't even imagine. How does Jesus care for us? Very much. He cares for us very much. How does he care for us? He loves us. He loves us. What else? He forgives us. And that's very important. And okay, one more Bible thing that I found for today for our blessing of the animals. The book of Proverbs. It's in the Old Testament. It's full of a bunch of sayings and wisdom and things that really help us in our life. And one of the verses says, good people take care of their animals. Sound good? Oh, we should do, right? Dylan. We do have Sunday school today, so let's pray and then we'll go to Sunday school. Dear Lord, may we care for our animals, for our pets, for our livestock, just as much as you care for us. You have given us this earth and all that lives in my end. So may we be good stewards of your kingdom. Amen. <coughs> Follow and stubborn. 
You welcome us to your fold, but we make others feel as if they don't belong. Forgive our life-alienating ways, our exclusion and judgment, the way we evaluate and compare, demean and degrade. Redeem us, restore us, help us be faithful as your flock. Amen. Christ forgives, Christ transforms, Christ renews. Christ leads us down the path of new beginnings. We are a new creation in Christ. Know this. Be forgiven. Amen.
and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from Him whatever we ask, because we obey His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. All who obey His commandments abide in Him, and He abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, and by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In these weeks after Easter, it seems that every time that I consult my resources, go through what I do to study the scripture of the day, I keep coming across this one phrase over and over. God meets you where you are. This is a phrase that I think is very counter to society and what society wants us to think. Society tells us that we must be a certain way, act a certain way, wear certain clothes to fit in. I remember my high school days and always having the worry that I wore one outfit way too many times. Society decides what is in and what is out who is in and who is out. But God doesn't work that way. God doesn't set limitations on grace. With the coming of Jesus, God turns all that on its head and meets us, finds us, calls to us, and loves us where we are. The Gospel tells the story of Jesus and the epistles remind us of this story and our part in it. First John describes a new way of God's love and God meeting us where we are and then bringing us into that love and then calling us to love one another. Prior to these verses that Diane read today are the words, this is the message that you heard from the beginning. Love each other. Love each other is a story in the Bible, a message in the Bible that goes to great lengths to tell us these words over and over again. And those words are what marks the midpoint and shift of this entire letter of 1 John. From the hostility that the community is receiving from the outside world to the necessity of love in the community <coughs> and that they need to share it. Right after that verse that I just read and before the verses of today, the verse continues with, don't behave like Cain. So 1 John brings us back to Genesis, an important note that takes us all the way to where Cain and Abel are the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain, the firstborn, was a farmer, and his brother Abel was a shepherd. The brothers gave gifts to God, and God was very pleased with Abel, but not so much with Cain. And this sent Cain into a jealous rage, and he murdered his brother. Cain ended up living a life of wandering, lost. Why? Because he was not of God. Because he could not love, and 1 John reminds us that Cain was not with God. If you are without love, then you are without God. First John also reminds us that the one who contrasts Cain, who is the opposite of Cain, is Jesus. Jesus loves us, is willing to, to die for us instead of kill. This action, this love is of God. Love is known in action. And how do we know God's love? 
It is through God's action in sending Jesus Christ into the world and through Christ's action of laying down his life for us. The actions of God show us what God is like, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And this same test applies to our love. How do others know what is in our heart? Is it by our actions, our words? Just as God's love is known to us through the visible action of Christ, so our love is known to others through concrete actions that mirror Christ's own. It's why we go out into the world and serve. In Genesis, Cain tries to hide what he has done from God, but God comes looking for him. God knows him, God knows what he's done, and he sees him. Even though he knows, he still asks, where is Abel? Where is your brother? And Cain responds with, am I my brother's keeper? And this question then is answered in 1 John with a resounding yes. Yes, we are our brother's keeper. We are supposed to be looking out for one another. And verses 16 through 18 focus on this one primary theme. The commandment of mutual love is the basis of community. Love as a way of life. Love first and foremost. And it speaks about laying down our lives. We speak these words with tones of awe, and well, we should. A scary thought to think about laying down one's life for another. The only time we hear these words is to praise the sacrifice of a soldier who dies to save others, or perhaps to speak of rescuers who die while attempting to save others from a burning building or from rising waters. To lay down one's life is an action. Specifically, this often surprising action of extraordinary self-sacrifice. The ultimate test of love. But for Christians, self-sacrifice should be ordinary, not extraordinary, not something that needs to be talked about or written about or praised. We ought to lay down our lives, John writes not intending to give a grand challenge for the heroic Christian, but an everyday commandment for ordinary Christians just like us. The Christian life is a life laid down for others. It's a life of self-sacrifice. It's a love that shows no distinction between believing in God following Jesus, and loving your neighbor. You can't have one without the other. They are not mutually exclusive. 1 John 4 will make this point again. So if you continue to read in 1 John, it will say this. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters, whom they have seen, can hardly love God who they have not seen. Again, actions speak louder than words. If the person right in front of us needs us to love them, then that is what we should do. Love is about putting the other before self, even unto death. That is what Jesus did, and if he did that, if he died on the cross, if he conquered death, if he rose from the grave, then can't we be expected to love one another? Seems a simpler of the two, doesn't it? But the problem comes when our hearts do not always support the love that we are called to. We can love against our will by obeying the we can love against our will, our thoughts, if we obey. Two commandments, love God, 
low neighbor. These verses have been used as a fear tactic. Be careful because God knows your heart. God knows what you've been thinking. The Bible shares many stories of people trying to hide from God. Adam did it. Cain did it. Moses did it. Jonah did it, and then they got swallowed by a whale. But fear does not need to be the motivation. We shouldn't love one another because we're fearful of what God will think. This passage is much more focused on comfort than condemnation. Yes, God knows what we have been thinking, and sometimes our hearts do betray us. But how we act on those inclinations is what is important. God's commandments are a way of overcoming. Of overcoming. Our inmost thoughts of anger, hatred, jealousy, greed, etc. God meets us where we are in all of that. And hopefully, and hopefully too, God's words and commands soften our hearts. It takes a whole lot of courage to follow God's commandment to love one another. It's easy to disagree, to fight, to post an opinion without thinking or caring about who it might hurt in the end. But to sit with another and to listen, and to disagree, but to hear both sides, to talk about it, to understand what they have to say, that takes work. <clears throat> that takes courage. The good news here is that when we act lovingly, we can be assured that nothing less than the love of God in Jesus Christ is pulsing through our hearts and our hands and our feet. In our actions. Jesus Christ is the very symbol of love of God here on earth, is always present in our acts of love. The self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ is the ground and motivation and meaning of our own self-sacrificing love. We love because we were loved. And when we keep the love commandment, we are one with Christ. We abide in Christ. And John tells us and that Christ abides in us. In that last sentence, abide, 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 used over and over in the scripture to be with God. <coughs> God meets us where we are. So my question today to think about, to leave with you, is are you willing to meet others where they are? Are you willing to meet God? Amen.
please stand and join me in our affirmation of our faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. You may be seated. Humbled by God's generosity, let us offer our gifts to God in Christ Church.
neighbor, Faith, had surgery on Thursday um, for uterine cancer, and I'd like prayers for her. I'm not sure if, what the future will hold for her as far as treatment.
had surgery for uterine cancer and is now awaiting the next steps. We pray that you give her strength in the waiting, in the wondering of what treatment will be and what will come next. Hold her close. And we pray for Laura's grandma Diane having surgery to remove a tumor from her spine. We are thankful that it was not cancerous, but we are sorry to hear that, that she can no longer use her leg. Be with her in her inpatient care moving forward. Be with all those looking after her and help her regain strength in that leg. for John's teacher, Karen, having triple bypass surgery tomorrow. We ask that you hold her close today and tonight on the eve of her surgery. Help calm her fears, calm her mind, and hold her close in her surgery tomorrow. Be with the doctors and nurses and all that will be caring for her with her class as they wonder and wait for news of how she is doing. May we hold all of these people close in our hearts and in our prayers. May our prayers be ones that never stop. Hear our prayers for the innocent caught in the crosshairs of war. Hear our prayers for soldiers suffering from injury and PTSD. Hear our prayers for the sick and those who care for them. Hear our prayers for the grieving, the exhausted, the depressed. Hear our prayers for those in need of resurrection hope. And now hear us as we pray together the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father.
We are an Easter people. Christ is risen. Live into the hope of Christ's resurrection and follow him as our good shepherd. So when Jesus calls, be sure to answer. And may the grace, hope, peace, and love of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.